Hi everyone, Brenda Gustin here, and I'm going to be talking about section 6.1 in chapter 6 that is microbial growth and nutrition. And so you probably have some concept of what nutrition is, it's hard not to. Um, and you know, it's it's the the what an organism needs to consume to be healthy, um, to uh, to work at their optimal activity. So um, they have a little bit of background information there if you're interested in reading that. Um, I, I thought this section right here was kind of interesting, talking about the chemical analysis of the microbial cytoplasm. And, you know, obviously inside of a cell, it's going to be mostly water, but the organic molecules, remember we said organic molecules were the ones that have carbon and hydrogen, um, are, and we had four major groups of organic molecules. Um, Proteins are the most prevalent, so proteins are, are quite important. They all are, but that one in particular is in high abundance. Um, and 97% of the cell dry weight has organic compounds. 96% um, of the cell dry weight is composed of just six elements. These organic compounds are mostly made by these elements. And you can you see them listed as C-H-O-N-P-S, chumps. Chomps, <laughs> it's hard to say, um, but carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And these are all, somehow, cells need to acquire these nutrients in order to, to function. Um, it says a cell simple as E. coli can have, about, have on the order of 5,000 different compounds associated with it. Um, and here's some again some of those statistics it's just kind of interesting to look at proteins um, make up a large part of the organic molecules and then you can see carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and hydrogen those are the most abundant elements remember the difference of molecules and elements a couple of the let's see the i wanted to talk a little bit about carbon because one of the things that you have to do when you're growing cells or when cells are in any environment growing that they have to have some source of carbon and we can divide organisms into two major groups not even just microorganisms but any organisms into two major groups the autotrophs and the heterotrophs and that's what defines their carbon source and it says a heterotroph is an organism that must obtain its carbon in organic form. So it has to somehow take in organic molecules to get carbon. And so we're heterotrophs. We eat all sorts of wonderful foods to get our carbon. And um, an autotroph, on the other hand, is what they say a self-feeder, meaning they don't have to go somewhere else to get food. They actually take in carbon dioxide from the air and that would be the photosynthetic organisms that can um, that are autotrophs. So things like plants and photosynthetic microorganisms would be autotroph autotrophs. So um, there's a lot of heterotrophic bacteria, and there are some autotrophic microorganisms too. If you, you see from this table that there's all sorts of other variations on that theme, and I just don't go into all that detail. It's more than we can possibly cover in a, a semester. Um, this one, this NCLEX question, these are always good to practice. The uh, saprobe was a vocabulary word you had when we talked about fungi, so you might want to make sure you answer that one. And this one just gives you a little bit on different elements. Um, this topic right here, this is essential nutrients. It, um, I, I think it's a really weird term that they're using right here. I think what they would be a better term would be essential elements. And so for microbes, the elements that we absolutely need to be able, they need to consume carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphate, sulfur, all of those have to be supplied to the microorganisms in order for them to um, function normally. So if we look at carbon and whether they get it autotrophically or heterotrophically, it says it's the most common um, among, among the common organic molecules that it is needed for it. Um, remember, organic molecules are, are carbon-based, so you need carbon to make proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids. Um, and there's actually other nutrients that are that you need carbon for also. And so organisms are either going to get their carbon either from carbon dioxide, autotrophs, or from their food, heterotrophs. Hydrogen is also essential to make 
all those organic molecules. And um, we get hydrogen from all sorts of things. Um, it says helps them maintain their pH and um, it's essential to, for making all sorts of important molecules. And cells are going to easily acquire hydrogen with when they take in organic molecules or other, um, other molecules, even from the air, they can get hydrogen. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about oxygen in detail. And there's some all sorts of interesting things, things about oxygen. But um, again, oxygen is a, a component that's important for all cells. It's in the organic, four types of organic molecules. Um, it's involved in structural molecules. And um, it's, there's a lot of it in the atmosphere. So cells can take up oxygen or get it from organic molecules. Um, nitrogen is kind of interesting that I think a lot of people think about the air and think that it's mostly oxygen, but it's actually mostly nitrogen. So 79% of the, the atmosphere is actually nitrogen gas. And um, bacteria play a really important role in cycling nitrogen and creating, um, taking nitrogen from the air and putting it into the soil. But um, nitrogen is a really important element because DNA um, has those A, T, Gs, and Cs, you know, the, the bases, and they're called nitrogenous bases. They have nitrogen in them. RNA has, has them too. ATP is a nucleic acid, has nitrogen in it. Um, nitrogen is essential for the structure of proteins. And um, there's all sorts of um, ways to get nitrogen, again, from organic compounds, from the foods they eat. And here it says a small number of bacteria and archaea can take nitrogen from the air and um, do something called nitrogen fixation, which puts it in the soil. So nitrogen is a, an essential element for all living organisms. Phosphate is important in DNA and RNA. Um, the DNA has sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate along the sides of the ladder, so you need that. Um, and ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Sulfur is an important element for um, some amino acids. So all of these elements are, are, have to somehow be supplied to the organisms in order for them to, to grow. Um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about how organisms get molecules into their cells. And here we're talking about um, the, the cell membrane, the cytoplasmic membrane, also called the plasma membrane or the cell membrane. And remember that the cell membrane, so we have the cytoplasm, the inside of a cell, that's surrounded by the cell membrane, and there might be a wall on the outside. But the wall doesn't really control what goes in and out. The wall is more like a basket, like a firm basket. Inside of the wall, you have the cytoplasmic membrane, and that's the phospholipid bilayer. That's what's going to control what goes in and out of the cell. And um, one of the mechanisms that molecules and, um, use to go in and out of cells is diffusion. And you guys are familiar with the concept of diffusion. Diffusion just means the movement of molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration. And that's diffusion. And so you could have diffusion in a room like this. If I put a bottle, opened a bottle of perfume, the perfume would be at high concentration right near the bottle. But over time, molecules of the perfume would spread through the room and I would have a uniform scent all the way through the room. So that's a common way that um, some small molecules can get into cells through diffusion. Um, a type of diffusion that I want to talk about here because it's going to be important for microbial growth and for microbial control is the concept of osmosis. And osmosis is something that you've heard in other classes. You'll hear it about if you take nursing, you'll hear about it in nursing, um, other biology classes. It's a really important concept. And so we said osmosis is a, is a form of diffusion. It's the diffusion of water. And it's not just the diffusion of water like on my tabletop. It's the diffusion of water through a selectively permeable membrane. And that means um, through a membrane that lets some things through but not others. So a cytoplasmic membrane is an example of a selectively permeable membrane. So in biological systems, we say um, osmosis is the movement of water through the movement of water through a, uh, through a, a cell membrane or through a cytoplasmic membrane. We call that osmosis. 
Um, let's see. Um, so being a form of diffusion, water is going to move by osmosis until the water concentration is going to be the same on both sides of the membrane. So there's a little video here. It's just like two minutes or a minute and a half that talks a little bit about osmosis. And I think it's worth your while to click on that and, and review that. Um, here, there's just a model of osmosis showing you here's a, a semi-permeable membrane, just a model in a beaker of water. So these blue dots are water. The red dots are some kind of solute. Um, let's say salt or carbohydrate or something that would be in a cell, but they're too big to get through that membrane. And so as, by osmosis, the water is going to move from high concentration to lower concentration. Now, how we, how we have lower concentration of water is to have a higher amount of solute. We have a higher amount of solute. We have a higher amount of these salt or sugar molecules the concentration of water is going to be lower. So in this, this example, it's showing you the water is going to be higher concentration outside. It's going to move in because osmosis says water is going to move from high concentration to low. And it's actually going to increase the pressure to push the water up this little tube that they have right here. Talk a little bit about osmosis and IVs, which is really important. Now, I know you've heard of all this isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic, and the picture down here um, gives you a little demo of what all that is. Now, um, I also made a little video that I posted in on your Brightspace page um, that just says osmosis. I think it's about four minutes that explains osmosis with some different pictures um, that might work better for you. But the bottom line with osmosis is you can put cells in what we call an isotonic solution. Now notice in this diagram, they have cells that have a wall like bacterial cells or cells without a wall like animal cells, like our own cells. In an isotonic solution, iso means the same. That means you have the same amount of salt inside as outside the cell. And in this picture, the salt or the sugar, let's call it salt, is these little are these little blue dots. So there's the same amount of salt inside the cell as outside the cell, whether you're a bacterial cell or an animal cell. And so osmosis says water is going to move from high concentration to low. So every molecule of water that moves in, one's going to move out because the concentration is the same on either side. The cell will be perfectly happy. Things will be going well. They'll be functioning normally. So when a cell is in an isotonic solution, things are going well. Um, our cells in our body, we have all sorts of homeostatic mechanisms that keep our salt concentration um, constant in our body. So our cells are always bathed in an isotonic solution. Cells that are in a hypotonic solution, hypo means low. So if we put a cell in a hypotonic solution, there's a low amount of solute in the solution surrounding the cell. So here we're saying we have a low amount of salt, if that's our solute, outside the cell. And we have a higher amount inside. And that can happen a lot because cells concentrate different chemicals inside of themselves. And so here we have a higher amount of water because we have a lower amount of solute, a lower amount of water inside because we have a higher amount of solute. Osmosis says, water is going to move from high concentration to low. So um, here we have our higher concentration of water. It's going to move into the cell. Now in this, back, in this cell, the cell's not going to um, have any problem because it's got that cell wall around it. So even if more cell, more water gets inside the cell, the cell might just get a little firmer, but it can function fine in a hypotonic environment. In the case of a human cell that doesn't have a cell wall, as water moves into it, this plasma membrane, the cytoplasmic membrane enlarges and, you know, the cell could eventually pop and that cell can burst open. And I think that's what they're trying to show you here, that this cell can eventually burst open. So a cell like a bacterial cell that's in a hypotonic solution, high amount of water, low amount of salt, the cell can function normally. But a human cell or an animal cell that 
doesn't have a cell wall will potentially burst in a hypotonic solution. Now, if we take a cell, and a hypotonic solution would be something like pond water or bathtub water, whatever, okay? A hypertonic solution means you have a high amount of solute in the solution surrounding the cell. The higher amount of solute, the higher amount of, the lower amount of water. So we have low water outside, um, higher water inside. Osmosis says water moves from high concentration to low. And what's going to happen is the water is going to leave the cell in a hypertonic solution. And um, the cell, the cytoplasmic membrane is going to shrivel up. And that is not compatible with life, whether you're a bacterial cell and have a cell wall or you're a human cell without a cell wall. When the cell shrivels up, the cell becomes uh, small, wrinkled, distorted. Um, there's not enough water to, to complete the normal chemical reactions and it's too concentrated and the cell will die. So if we look at the difference here in isotonic solutions, cells with cell walls and without walls are fine. In hypotonic solutions, cells with cell walls are fine, but cells without walls can burst. And finally, in a hypertonic solution, cells with a wall will die and cells without a wall will die either way. So the top pictures here are, bacteria, are representing bacteria and these are representing animal cells. This goes into some detail about that and um, that's where I'm going to stop this video.